Now, in the 1960s, the term liberation theology began to gain currency with the writings and the teachings of preachers, pastors, priests, and professors from Latin America. Their theology was done from the underside. Their viewpoint was not from the top down or from a set of teachings which undergirded imperialism. Their view viewpoints, rather, were from the bottom up. The thoughts and understandings of God, the faith, religion, and the Bible from those whose lives were ground under, mangled, and destroyed by the ruling classes or the oppressors. Liberation theology started in and started from a different place. It started from the vantage point of the oppressed. In the late 1960s, when Dr. James Cone's powerful books burst on to the scene, the term black liberation theology began to be used. I do not in any way disagree with Dr. Cohn, nor do I in any way diminish the inimitable and incomparable contributions that he has made and that he continues to make to the field of theology. Jim, incidentally, is a personal friend of mine. I call our faith tradition, however, the prophetic tradition of the black church because I take its origins back past Jim Cohn past the sermons and songs of Africans in bondage in the transatlantic slave trade. I take it back past the problem of Western ideology and notions of white supremacy. I take and trace the theology of the black church back to the prophets in the Hebrew Bible and to its last prophet in my tradition, the one we call Jesus of Nazareth. The prophetic tradition of the black church has its roots in Isaiah, the 61st chapter, where God says the prophet is to preach the gospel to the poor and to set at liberty those who are held captive. Liberating the captives also liberates those who are holding them captive. It frees the captives and it frees the captors. It frees the oppressed and it frees the oppressors. The prophetic theology of the black church during the days of chattel slavery was a theology of liberation. It was preached to set free those who were held in bondage spiritually, psychologically, and sometimes physically. And it was practiced to set the slaveholders free from the notion that they could define other human beings or confine a soul set free by the power of the gospel. The prophetic theology of the black church during the days of segregation, Jim Crow, lynching, and the separate but equal fantasy was a theology of liberation. It was preached to set African Americans free from the notion of second class citizenship, which was the law of the land, and it was practiced to set free misguided and miseducated Americans from the notion that they were actually superior to other Americans based on the color of their skin. The prophetic theology of the black church in our day is preached to, to set African Americans and all other Americans free from the misconceived notion that different means deficient. Being different does not mean one is deficient. It simply means one is different, like snowflakes, like the diversity that God loves. Black music is different from European and European music. It is not deficient, it is just different. Black worship is different from European and European American worship. It is not deficient, it is just different. Black preaching is different from European and European American preaching. It is not deficient, it is just different. It is not bombastic, it is not controversial, it's different. <laughs> Those of you who can't see on C-SPAN, we had one or two working press clap along with <laughs> the non-working press. Black learning styles are different from European and European American learning styles. They are not deficient. They are just different. This principle of different does not mean deficient. It's at the heart of the prophetic theology of the black church. It is a theology of liberation. 
The prophetic theology of the black church is not only a theology of liberation, it is also a theology of transformation, which is also rooted in Isaiah 61, the text from which Jesus preached in his inaugural message as recorded by Luke. When you read the entire passage from either Isaiah 61 or Luke 4, and do not try to understand the passage or the content of the passage in the context of a soundbite. What you see is God's desire for a radical change in a social order that has gone sour. God's desire is for positive, meaningful, and permanent change. God does not want one people seeing themselves as superior to other people. God does not want the powerless masses, the poor, the widows, the marginalized, and those underserved by the powerful few to stay locked into six systems which treat some in the society as being more equal than others in that same society. God's desire is for positive change, transformation, real change, not cosmetic change, transformation, radical change, or a change that makes a permanent difference, transformation. God's desire is for transformation, changed lives, changed minds, changed laws, changed social orders, and changed hearts in a changed world. This principle of transformation is at the heart of the prophetic theology of the black church. These two foci of liberation and transformation have been at the very core of the black religious experience from the days of David Walker, Harriet Tubman, Richard Allen, Jarena Lee, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, and Sojourner Truth through the days of Adam Clayton Powell, Ida B. Wells, Dr. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, Barbara Jordan, Cornell West, and Fannie Lou Hamer. These two foci of liberation and transformation have been at the very core of the United Church of Christ since his predecessor denomination, the Congregational Church of New England, came to the moral defense and paid for the legal defense of the Mende people aboard the slave ship Amistad since the days when the United Church of Christ fought against slavery, played an active role in the Underground Railroad, and set up over 500 schools for the Africans who were freed from slavery in 1865. And these two foci remain at the core of the teaching teachings of the United Church of Christ as it has fought against apartheid in South Africa and racism in the United States of America ever since the Union which formed the United Church of Christ in 1957. These two foci of liberation and transformation have also been at the very core and the congregation of Trinity United Church of Christ since it was founded in 1961. And these foci have been the bedrock of our preaching and practice for the past 36 years. Our congregation, as you heard in the introduction, took a stand against apartheid when the government of our country was supporting the racist regime of the African government in South Africa. Our congregation stood in solidarity with the peasants in El Salvador and Nicaragua while our government, through Ali North and the Iran-Contra scandal, was supporting the Contras who were killing the peasants and the Miskito Indians in those two countries. Our congregation sent, sent 35 men and women through accredited seminaries to earn their Master of Divinity degrees with an addition currently being enrolled in the seminary. Senior citizen housing complexes and running two child care programs for the poor, the unemployed, the low-income parents on the south side of Chicago for the past 30 years. Our congregation feeds over 5,000 homeless and needy families every year while our government cuts food stamps and spends billions fighting in an unjust war in Iraq. <laughs> 